Hi everybody, welcome to PureRack. Today we are talking with Artur Hebda, a Ruby developer at a company called Railsware. Hi. And the freaking speaking at Ruby conference, where he talks about code quality, intersection and uh, product design. Artur, welcome to PureRack. Thank you, welcome. <laughs> so, and the first question. Uh, so, what is the kind of company is Railsware? How many people are you? And uh, how did you personally choose it's a place to work? Well, we're kind of in this like transformation period um, where we started as a software consultancy company, uh, but we didn't what client wanted, we did what client needed. Um, so the first thing that was kind of different was that except for just software engineering and design services, we offered also product management services. So we helped clients essentially build their products. And now we started to use that knowledge that we have acquired over, well, several years um, to build our own products. And I'm working on one of those. Uh, what kind of people are we? Well, I guess we are T-shaped specialists. Some of us are generalists. So there are different kinds of people really. It's hard to tell, but definitely T-shapedness helps here. Um, how I picked Railsware? Well, it's interesting. Like previously, I was working in Android, uh, and before that, I was working uh, with Ruby. So I kind of make this step aside um, and try something new to like broaden horizons. And, and then um, uh, I was in a recruitment process uh, in several Android companies, like mobile dev shops, for example, and so on. Um, and I picked Railsware as the only company that I was like giving chances in the Ruby world. And then I, um, eventually I picked up Railsware because I was impressed by the recruitment process, like the test tasks, um, how diligent they were, like uh, working per culture, focus on the product and like gathering requirements and those kind of things. And also communication. Like they, they had a very different approach to this entire process from those two perspectives than any other company that I tried before. Um, so that seemed like a perfect shot for me back then. So Ruby was the main point why you chose Railsway, yeah? No, actually it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was kind of more into Android back then. Um, so like Railsway was the, the only option that I considered um, in terms of going back to Ruby. So for me it was kind of going back, but I have like no regrets to be honest because I'm really happy about that, that move. <laughs> Nice to hear. Uh, you mentioned the process uh, used to develop products as a Railsware is different to most software development companies. Uh, what exactly are those differences? Well, I guess that it starts with like what we do before we start working. Really, um, some people tend to like jump straight to the task and start writing code. We don't do that we try to understand what this is all about, why we do it, why client believes that it's worth doing in the first place. So we try to like map out all the requirements, understand the uh, user problems, understand the product market, and understand how those things fit together and what's the place of this particular story or feature uh, to make that happen. Um, so we seek the understanding first because that helps us making the right decision when it comes to code. Because if we don't know like um, what's the goal of what we're doing, then most likely we'll, um, we'll make more tech debt and most likely also not address the right needs of users. So we start with that. And then um, something that I have never tried before is working in pair. Um, so that has many benefits, like you move forward faster in terms of like understanding the problems, uh, figuring out what are the solutions, like discussing different solution directions, variations, uh, and then you make better decisions in the end. Side effect is that you increase bus factor. So if like, let's say one person leaves the company, the other person has the knowledge as well. So it's not like we have like one man project that uh, single person does everything and knows everything and nobody except that person knows anything in there. No, we don't do that. Uh, we try to have uh, more people involved so that the knowledge is shared and then we share it within company as well. So you're trying to avoid a uh, situation where many people are dependencies in the company. It sounds terrible, but yeah. kind of yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Is there a standard technology stack at Railsware uh, that you prefer across all projects? Um, how has this evolved over time? 
Well, so kind of name suggests that we are gravitating towards Rails and that's what we do. Like we usually start new projects with Rails when we see it's a fit, but we're trying not to limit ourselves to just that. So for example, Meltrum, uh, you might have heard of it. So it was written first in Rails entirely, but then we moved some parts like SMTP server, like incoming traffic, um, the handling thing specifically to Golang because it was much faster and it needed less resources and so on. So there were many benefits in terms of like concurrent processing um, when compared to Rails. So we, we start there, but we try not to limit ourselves. We have some um, standard approaches in terms of uh, using certain techniques, not necessarily the tools. Um, so all of us do like service object approach, but some projects use Trailblazer, some not. Um, so sometimes it's like our own implementation, sometimes it's not. It depends on the project, really. Um, it's hard to say what happens when we start something new because I was kind of in a different part of the company recently. Um, but this kind of stayed pretty much, pretty much the same, I guess. Well, like latest Ruby, Rubocop, mm -hmm. latest Rails, that kind of thing. So this is, this is a common pattern, but what comes next is really depending on the project. Um, and things have changed more uh, on the front end part, really. Like we started, well, <laughs> you know, you, you know the thing, right? Yeah, we have a project with Angular, so you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, JavaScript evolves really, really quickly. JavaScript uh, evolves, yeah. <laughs> so we kind of adopted those new new things and those new trends, and we try those things. Like very often, we we learn uh, also from Alex Vasiliev, yeah. uh, who was involved in Pivot, right? Yeah, he tries a lot of new things, and um, thanks to them as well. Thanks to him as well, we try those things in our projects as well. So um, we moved to Yarn, we moved to React. Um, I guess we don't have any Angular projects anymore. Everything is React, or we have projects that we migrate to React. So it might not there be be there yet, but we're we'll trying to like be there at some point. So this is kind of our front end standard stack. So Yarn, React, Webpack, um, all the kind of modern tools. Okay. Why would you want to migrate an existing project to Rails in the first place? Uh, whose initiative this was, companies or the clients? And uh, what was considered before making the decision? Um, okay, four questions. Um, let me start maybe with the easiest one. So whose initiative it yeah. was? Um, so it was engineers initiative. Um, the context was kind of specific um, because there was a well significant rotation of people. So this is the project where I onboard people. So I'm kind of the only like, permanent part um, and a lot of people come and go. So we use it as an onboarding platform as an onboarding ground, so people come, um, we show them our approaches and they bring something new. Every new person brings something new. Um, and I notice over time that there is a lot of friction, like there are things that I'm used to, right? I've spent some time on this project, um, but they are not. They come from like mainstream projects. Mainstream in terms of Ruby is Rails. Everyone uses Rails, everyone is used to the ways uh, the things are in Rails or the gems that are part of Rails or are very close to Rails or are used mainstream. So we have this like strong thing uh, in Ruby community, unlike JavaScript, where everyone does things differently. Um, in Ruby, it's kind of not like that. Um, so I see this pain of newcomers, right? Like, Every new person struggles with some things that I have already been used to for, for many, many months. And at some point I noticed um, that we keep inventing things that were in Rails, that have been in Rails for, for many, many years. Um, so there was kind of no point in like doing it uh, on our side. Um, so that was kind of the main points. And we started to see that we grew the project, uh, we grew the code base too much and Sinatra in that case couldn't handle it. So it didn't scale that great. There were issues like um, we had to upgrade Sinatra quite often uh, because of security patches. Uh, and I've looked at Rails and it wasn't the case. So we had to put more effort because of using Sinatra. We also used SQL instead of Active Record. So we couldn't benefit uh, easily. Factory bot, paper trail, 
um, or some other gems that, that we were trying to use. We had to invent something on our side. So that leads to more code and more bugs. And that was more expensive because the cheapest code is the code that you don't write. Um, so that was kind of the, the, the main goals um, or the main reasons why we decided to, to migrate. To use like modern tech stack. Well, we used the latest versions, but we kind of had to re re reinvent everything ourselves. So we wanted to use more tools, um, have less bugs, so less code, less bugs, um, and not feel like we are in some kind of unsecure environment when we have to like patch those things uh, every now and then. So that was kind of the main points. And then there were things like people came and they saw something and they thought, well, uh, in an active record world, you've got this nice DB. We had project specific namespace and they were like, what? Uh, or migrations, we used like integer based versioning for SQL migrations and that started to like cause problems because different people started to work on different things and then you have to somehow manage all those things. Um, so there were like, that was obviously a tech debt and we saw possibility in Rails, uh, in moving to Rails um, to help us like removing and cleaning it up. Yeah, it, it's nice ways like problem with Sinatra is always the same. You're starting doing something small, but then you one more feature, one more layer, one more feature and you end up with Rails. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, this way or another. Yeah, in the previous company common case. we had the same case. Uh, we like one guy decided to start writing a, um, that was messaging platform in Padrino. And then <laughs> the guys didn't like him for that decision for a very long time. And then they switched to Rails uh, quite soon because they had to, because they, they were building things that were not supposed to be built, right? They could avoid that. Okay, uh, what was the team like on this project? And uh, have you any of you attempted in a similar migration before? Um, well, so as I mentioned, uh, like the team was kind of under high rotation. So I was the only permanent person uh, like leading the project and there was a lot of onboardies uh, going, coming and going. Um, so that was kind of the thing and my, like nobody from us have ever attempted that thing uh, to migrate from non-Rails to Rails. Um, I had some prior experience with Sinatra, Grape, Rails, and migrating from Rails 2 to Rails 3, and then from Rails 4, uh, 3 to 4, and then 4 to 5. Uh, so that kind of, I had this kind of understanding of what might be the, the main pain points on, on the way. But, well. <laughs> yeah, migrating from Rails to, from, to Rails 3. So many pain in this world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah. let's start about with a um, little bit more technical questions. Uh, so, what uh, was the stack uh, you started with? So, we started with Sinatra and we used Sinatra apps, um, like in this modular approach. Uh, we used them kind of like controllers. So, we were like wiring together using um, rack URL map, if I remember correctly, something around rack. Uh, so we, we put it together this way and shared code was shared through modules, like for example, authentication. Um, on the ORM side, we use SQL. It's really nicely designed, I would say, uh, but it has its own issues, which robusts are usually not used to. Like for example, you update the record, and there are no updates to be applied to database and this method returns nil uh, instead of the receiver. So those are the things that were like causing us issues. Um, other things were, I guess, kind of typical. So we had RSpec, we didn't have many uh, like Sinatra specific gems. Uh, we started to introduce history at some point. So we had paper trail, like SQL flavor, <laughs> of course. Um, but we didn't have really much uh, additional gems because it's a simple MP API. It serves mostly like a CRUD for a single page application. So we have CRUD there plus uh, authentication. So like from this perspective, it wasn't like very big. It was very simple um, and it provided like JSON responses and CSV responses for export. Um, and yeah, like 
dealing with JSON was also a bit of an issue because you have to do it manually, like parse the params and the body and so on. So something that you get for free from Rails, you have to do yourself in Sinatra or use some like rack contrib or something. Yeah, as uh, Alexei Vasiliev like to say, you could to do this and you have to do this. So. <laughs> yep, you have no uh, And uh, what was the stack you ended up with? So we ended up with Rails 5.1, if I remember correctly. Um, Active record, yes, huge win. Uh, factory bot, huge win. Um, yeah, I guess those were the main things that we had to migrate. Yeah. Uh, how detailed of a plan did you create beforehand, and uh, how much of it was figuring it uh, out as we go? Well, it's really hard to tell like how much we figured. Um, we kind of. We, when, well, when we realized that we'll be moving to Rails, we started to prepare ourselves in this uh, sense that we started to write code in a way that will be like, easier to, uh, to migrate to Rails. For example, we started writing feature specs using this factory approach, even if it was just a module with methods. So that later on we can, we have the same like principle and we can easily migrate code from this approach, like handmade, to factory bot. So that was one of the things that we did. Um, we tried to limit um, like specific things for SQL and use things that are similar to active record or they, or they are easily um, changeable, like find and replace kind of thing. Um, so we were using a lot of scopes uh, and that was a good thing. So that improved like code from one side and from the other side it gave us this option. Um, we also started to like map out all the issues that we might face. Like we were, we use this input approach. Um, so we try to capture things and put them in a single source of truth. Um, so for example, take that tickets end up in the same place where we have feature requests. So they end up in the same backlog. Um, so we're creating a lot of that kind of tickets and we created a special uh, component. So special context just for those. We mark them as rails. <laughs> Uh, take that rails. Uh, so we knew that that was about it. Um, and then we started to like investigate what are the issues and what are the potential options and ideas how we can solve them. Uh, one of them was how to migrate the database, like how to migrate the migration files, what to do about them, like how will that work? How will that work in the transitive period? Like we didn't expect that we'll do it just like that or in one go we knew that we'll be doing in small pieces, in small steps, over a longer period of time. So we are kind of trying to map out all those small things that we need to do in order to run Rails. Um, so I guess, yeah, we started there um, and then we started gradually rolling it out. Very good story about how to migrate. Uh, any major challenges along the way, unexpected, maybe some unexpected uh, roadblocks? Yeah, the main pain point really was with um, with uh, request specs, like calling them that way from the from the race perspective. So we had quite a lot of them, uh, and on, on top of them we had um, feature specs. So we didn't have to change feature specs much, but we had to change how we run the request specs, and that was pain uh, pain in the ass really, because we had this um, module based authentication flow uh, which was like including a separate controller so maybe that was not the ideal solution but we kind of went with it um, and then we had to like build a special kind of app out of the uh, like the current controller so described class um, and combine it with this authentication flow and then go for this authentication flow for the for the OAuth things to be set up uh, because we wanted to make sure that this will work um, so as much like integration end-to-end -end, uh, testing rather than unit testing because you know how you can end up with those unit testing like you know that all pieces work and then you uh, you hit feature spec on CI and it's red and it doesn't pass because you haven't anticipated some like integration things um, so we wanted to avoid that as much as we could because we knew that we'll be like at some point migrating to something else so we wanted to stay like framework agnostic and have as many tests like treating it as a black box rather than like a white box.
So that was like the main challenge, how to migrate that. Like handling session, for example, sharing it between Rails and Sinatra, that was kind of easy. You just like run, um, you just run uh, Sinatra within Rails, like on top of this, uh, this stack, mounting it as an app within routes. So there were some quirks, uh, but that was achievable. Running tests, on the other hand, that was, I guess, the, the main pain point, really. Yeah, if I re yeah, as I recall, that was the, the main issue that we didn't expect will, uh, will cause us that much, that much problems. I think that without tests, it, it was even impossible to migrate applications. Yeah, you wouldn't know if this works or not. You wouldn't even know like, how to test it, really. If you, if you don't know all the flows or all the cases, well, how can you make sure that it works? So we started with tests and we had a lot of tests and with feature specs, we cover 97, 98% of yeah. code base. Cool, very cool. Uh, how long did the project live in between Sinatra and Rails worlds uh, before you could launch it in the Rails stack um, for the first time? Hmm. Well, it's hard to say like how much time it took exactly because it's hard to say at which point we started running Rails. Like we started with um, like first like gathering all those inputs, like describing the problems, ideas and so on. Um, and at some point we started to boot the application through Rails. So we were just loading code through, lay, through Rails and that's it. We're still running Sinatra and everything, but we were booting our code through Rails. So if we say that was the first point when we started to run Rails, then I would say it was like six to nine months approximately. Uh, until we cleaned uh, everything up, it was in total, I guess, one year and a half. So it took, took a bit of time to like, deal with everything. Uh, at, what, at what point did you move the features test over? Um, so I guess if I remember correctly, that we moved them at the point where we started migrating controllers to be real Rails controllers. So instead of like using this uh, Sinatra apps in a modular way, we started to use Rails controllers and real routes. Um, so at that point, we started to move them. And the first one was painful, uh, but the next, um, next came much easier. Did you first move the code as is? Uh, and make sure it all worked before refactoring into elegant Rails code. Uh, for example, introducing service object, uh, whitelisting parameters and controllers, etc. Uh, or did you refactor as you went? Well, kind of both. Um, so when we started to move code as is, um, and when we saw that some things can be improved on the go, like quick wins, mm -hmm. low hanging fruits, then we did it. Uh, but we didn't try to like do two things at, well, at, at the same time. So we first migrated and then clean it up. So that's why this like difference between how much, how long it took to boot Rails and then how long it took to clean it up was so long because we did it as part of X Fridays. So not not to impede the like feature changes and evolution of the product. Uh, so we didn't spend much time on it, but it took a lot of time. Okay, and uh, what uh, stage is the project now? Um, so I would say that we have removed like 95% of the things that we were to clean up. Uh, we have some things still left in backlog, but those are like minor, uh, minor things. Like whitelisting params, yes. We didn't have to introduce service objects because we had them. So we didn't have much code that was reliant strictly on either Sinatra or Rails. Um, but yeah, whitelisting params, that was kind of another pain point because first we had no strong parameters and we were whitelisting them when we needed them. Mm -hmm. So that was straight in the service objects. And then we introduced strong parameters. So we changed the interface, uh, like how we use those objects and um, that causes us to use um, action controller parameters uh, in tests, which is not a good thing. So eventually that should be cleaned up and moved to controllers. So this is one of the things that are still left in the backlog. No, but uh, it's always about business. Uh, so how close uh, were your initial estimates for the project and uh, compared to the actual timeline? 
Well, thankfully, I didn't have to like, give the number, <laughs> like how long it will take, because, <laughs> well, the, the only thing that we knew is that we'll be doing it step by step. So that was the thing. And we didn't set a specific target that, okay, guys, let's migrate it until, I don't know, uh, summer 2018. No, we didn't do that. Um, I wouldn't, I guess that I wouldn't be even able to provide a, like a reasonable estimate. Uh, it would require a lot of time to like prepare it, to understand those things. Uh, but maybe if I had, then I would definitely start like collecting those small issues that you had to like address before you move to Rails or until you move to Rails. Um, and then once you have them like sketched out, you understand the issues, you have ideas, you know what are the possible solutions, then it gives you an idea how long it can take. So if I were to give a number, then I would use this approach. Thankfully, I didn't have to. Um, so, well, yeah, I guess it's, it would be hard to like, come up with, with a number. But as I said, we didn't, uh, we tried to like limit how we, prov like how we introduce the changes um, not to block the features that were needed. So we did it like by 20% of time. It's a very good point. A lot of young developers, they think that one and only way to change something in the projects, like stop the business and refactoring everything, like it's the wrong way. Now when no, no one will agree on this scenario. Yeah, business won't be happy. Yes, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's everything about business. So. What have you learned of the f this feature when you have to migrate another project? Well, it's worth doing, <laughs> definitely. Uh, our life now is much easier having Rails and being able to use all of those shiny gems that work perfectly with Rails. That's great, much less code. That's also a huge benefit. Uh, I've learned that it's worth doing step by step, definitely. Uh, this approach really worked very well. And it's also great to give newcomers voice uh, so that they can express their thoughts. Like it's, their fresh perspective is really valuable because we as people who are kind of stuck, like we, we are working on the same project for, for a period of time, we stop seeing things that might be weird, that might not be obvious. We learn them, we get used to them. And when someone new comes and has to learn all of that, you immediately see what is weird, what doesn't work, what is not intuitive, and what might cause problems in the future. So you start addressing those things, and then you understand what else you need to do in order to like, bring this code to like proper state. Um, so that's, that's definitely something to... Uh, to, to, to look into. When you have a chance to like migrate a project, um, ask for a fresh perspective of an outsider. That's definitely worth doing. Yeah, good point. How well do these rewrites work business-wise? Well, if we were to stop everything and rewrite in one go, then it wouldn't work that well. Uh, I guess it worked quite nicely because first we knew, like we made this decision that we'll be migrating to Rails ahead of time. So we knew like, I don't know, three months ahead, six months ahead that we'll be doing this. Um, so we could prepare ourselves and the code base and our approaches and uh, like invest some time into making those abstractions that will make it easier. Um, so fr that was really like, it wasn't an additional pain that we had uh, or effort that we had to put into this, um, it made our code better because it was more framework agnostic. So if something better comes in the future, then we are more likely to have code base that will be easy um, migratable to, to a different framework. Um, so I guess that the main point here would be not to impede uh, business much and just do it in small, tiny steps, but often. Uh, would you recommend other developers take initiative and propose uh, this technology stack change to the client? Uh, what are the things to think about before doing so? Um, I guess it's always worth like 
communicating about our ideas and share them because unshared ideas go into vain and there is no benefit of them. Like they are useless if we don't communicate about them or we do something about them, right? So that's, that's one thing. It's worth sharing ideas, definitely. Um, but before we do it, like clients are demanding, they want to know why, why it makes sense, why it makes sense for them, uh, why it makes sense for the team. What are the benefits for the product? Like, what are the issues? What are the risks? Um, so I would suggest to spend some time investigating the issues, those issues. What are the ideas to address them? What are potential benefits? What are potential risks? And see, like, try to explore the problem space as well as the solution space. So what is bothering us now? What is slowing us down? Where we have tech that? How can we address that? What can we do to make our life easier so we can be more productive and produce like better features, better product? Um, and then once we have this understanding, we can go to client and say, okay, we've run the analysis, we made our research, uh, we've done our homework, and we figured that we lose most time because we're using Sinatra, not Rails, for example, in our case. And then here is what we can do. We recommend doing it step by step. We can address this pain point, this pain point, that pain point. It will not impede the like, feature requests, right? And then you can like, present this analysis that you made. What are the issues? What are the ideas? What are the benefits? What are the risks? What we can gain? What we can lose? Because that's, I guess, how, how clients think. They want to know like, what can they get and what do they risk. Yeah, they always trying to like calculate the money. <laughs> okay, Arturo, thank you very much for your time and this and for this excellent story about how to migrate from non-rails to rails. I'm sure a lot of our viewers at YouTube, this story will be very helpful. And thank you for watching this video. See you. Thank you for having me.